Hey everybody, Sean James here. Welcome back to Alaska in this case and cabin back to the cabin soon. Two more days left in this epic trip and then I will be back to my everyday life. But for now, I'm sitting here with Mike Morrow and Mark Raycroft from Wild and Exposed Podcast. Unfortunately, Ron Hayes, who I finally did get to meet earlier this week, had to go home. Him and his son spent a week here and I got to spend three days, I think it was, with them. So unfortunately they're not here with us but we are having an awesome time out here I wanted to talk to the guys um, you hopefully you've been following along this whole Alaska series so you know a little bit about what's happening here but I wanted to just talk a little bit more about who the guys are and why I decided to trust them to come up here and, and stay <laughs> with them <laughs> in tight accommodations <laughs> not that tight <laughs> so yeah I wanted to introduce you formally or properly to them and and also let you know where you can find uh, what their their content that they create and how they got to the point in their life where they are in a, that they're in a place like this and offering this opportunity for me to come in and experience it and enjoy it with them so uh, I'm not sure where we want to start here but um, if you guys want to just jump in whenever or wherever but just tell me how who, who Wild and Exposed is and how it became about I guess a good place to start you want to go with that? Well, you had a good start. You you outlined it to somebody a week or so ago about what the premise was behind Wild and Exposed. I can run with it if you want, but it's you know the whole storytelling thing, the sharing what we do and how we kind of download on a trip and we're with friends at the end of a photo shooting experience. And yeah, yeah. I mean, when we come out and do a photo shoot like this, yeah, like we did today, yeah, we would all normally go out and shoot three or four hours. We'd come back, we'd all meet on a trailhead or we'd meet back at the cars or whatever. And it seemed like it'd be an hour or two of conversation about, oh, did you see that? Or mm -hmm. that was so cool. Or did you get this shot? And Mark and I have been friends for, I don't know, 10 years now. I don't even know what it is. And we've always talked about doing something. And, and when the podcasting thing came out, we got to thinking, how cool would it be if we just basically encapsulated that conversation that we would have back at the truck? but have it on a podcast and then share it with everybody because yeah. there's it's somewhat techy it's somewhat behavior you know did you get that shot mm -hmm. and it's just a chance to put it all out there and i think we've we've done that plus then we tried to do more now too it's kind of evolved now yeah, yeah. into something that hopefully is so how long has it been going on or like how, how many years uh, yeah. and how many episodes we've, we've been at it for a year and a half and we have quite a few episodes you can find on any podcast platform as well as on YouTube, and you can find us on Instagram. We now frequently have featured guests from all over the world, mm -hmm. successful yeah, photographers and other videographers. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I'm kind of tired of just hearing you guys talk. <laughs> we have, and all of our stories, the whole thing. So even the name Wild and Exposed came up because we're wildlife photographers or wildlife filmmakers. We're an international team, and Exposed is something that we always did as far as we talked about how many rolls of film did you expose on the trip. We, You know, it was a matter of creating that image whether it was film and now it's a dig digital sensor in a camera for stills or video so we're still exposing light to a sensor and that's why wild and exposed and we needed a name that caught for people and that's how that came up but it's about wildlife photography and sharing our stories from amazing destinations that we go to it's reflecting on adventures we've had in the past it's sharing tips and hacks and how to's in the field whether it's gear related whether it's travel related or whether it's actually camera related or we even go beyond that and talk about wildlife behavior because we're all wildlife biologists yeah, that's uh, as well yeah that that's um obviously you have more in you're more insightful more experience for capturing wildlife than the average person would be although a lot of photographers um, just become very good at their subject just because they're photographers actually so part of the Part of what I found fascinating about you guys and wildlife photography in particular is that I consider myself pretty knowledgeable knowledgeable about wildlife and pretty good at getting close to them mainly because I'm a bow hunter, especially a traditional bow hunter and have to really get intimate with the animals in order to be successful. But I realized after watching you guys and seeing your images how a wildlife photographer has to be even that much better at that. because you're shooting stills of an animal it's not one click and like it when you're hunting it's one shot 
and then you don't have to worry about anything after that you have to take that first click and then click 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 maybe for an hour, an hour you have to spend time with that animal so that first interaction that is usually the, the last interaction with an animal when you're hunting but when you're wildlife photography that first shot is the first interaction with that animal it goes on maybe for hours so the skill level is just that like, incredible i'm finding but it's you know it's it's a lot of fun and a challenge and something that you know we've both been doing this for 25 years and you know as far as mike and i and, and ron's been at it for uh, a decade as well and it's a matter of the culmination of all that time in the field but it's it's interesting you know the past four days that we've been spending doing moose in the mornings you see these 1500 pound animals and you think it's going to be easy to photograph them but this habitat they disappear in it in no time or the grass is up to their sh they're seven feet tall at the shoulder and the grass is covering most of them so to get a good image and to be on the right side of the light you know it, it's something we encourage people to try but it takes that experience and, and experimentation with their camera gear and first and foremost really understanding animal behavior for, you know, for this content. Well I was fascinated with um, bird photography about three years ago after just seeing images of other people's you know, shots on, on, on um, Instagram and I thought, I'm going to go out and capture a wood duck. I know some wood ducks. And it took me all spring wearing waders finally, sitting lying, well, sitting down in the middle of a, a beaver pond in about two feet of water, the chest waders on, water up to here with a monopod sitting like this, <laughs> when I realized I had to get the light behind me to get it on that animal perfectly. Because the wood duck is beautiful, but if the light casts creates a shadow on that body anywhere on the face or on the eye in particular the shots yeah you know, it's decent for an amateur photographer but it's certainly not winning any awards so it's, what you said about getting on the right side of that moose it's not a landscape you just walk around and get on the other side you got terrain to deal with you have his behavior to deal with you have where he wants to go where you don't want him to go because the lighting's not good there's so many variables like hats off to anybody like you guys that can capture the images that you do it takes i i think that biological background helps a ton right so you got to have the light and you got to have the right day but you also kind of if you know that animal you can kind of guesstimate and you can say well the situation is not right now but in 15 minutes mm -hmm. he's moving that way or it's going this way or whatever it is and rather than even dealing with it right now we'll go get positioned mm -hmm. for that Right. that next thing that chances are pretty good it's going to happen it doesn't yeah. always happen well but you know what that animal eats and there's that food over there so a good chance he's going over that spot right. or it's it's a uh, breeding season and we know the female went that way likely the male is about to follow so you get in that in that path so yeah that wildlife uh, biology I it's mean. interesting what you say about hunting it's i grew up hunting mark has done some hunting some a, hunting. Lot, a lot of hunting <laughs> I didn't know how much, <laughs> how much, we don't yeah. talk about it that much because we mainly are out shooting, but I think the reason I got into this was for that. It's, we're essentially hunting. Mm -hmm. It just is year round. Year round, no season. There's seasons. no season. Yeah. You get, you actually have a much more, speaking of what you said earlier too, you have a much more intimate experience yeah. with these animals shooting pictures because you do, you could be with a bull moose all day and you see that whole day in unfold and you know if if they lay down and take, take a nap i lay down and take You're a right. nap you know if, so if somebody wants to be a better hunter or somebody just wants to be better at, at getting close to animals there's nothing like wildlife photography to learn that because you know unlike hunting where the moose comes out you wait for that opportunity for an ethical clean shot you for the meat everything's in place as soon as that opportunity presents itself the hunter takes it whereas as a wildlife photographer you spend the whole day with that animal so you get to observe its behavior and you really learn its rhythms and that's something that I am, am very grateful for and, and that's one of the favorite parts of my job is just sharing that space with all these different animals and their personalities and getting getting to know them and then play that prediction game to try and get the best image and, and again for those out there for whatever reason they want to experience and get closer to and not in, a, in an unsafe way close but be able to observe these animals there's nothing like just spending hours and hours with them and the biology degree didn't do that the biology degree right. gave us a base on, on how these ecosystems work and these animals work in different population densities with one another and predator and prey but it was time in the field that mm -hmm. taught us about mm -hmm. the behavior and and then photography right 
lot of years in the field, not just one or two, like, and intensively on uh, specific species for maybe years before you get to the point where you have portfolios like you do of moose or white-tailed deer or whatever for bears. Um, I think the other cool thing about photography is you get to go be in places where the animals aren't hunted, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because it's a whole different, yeah. the animal has a whole different perspective. So a lot of the places we go, if we want to shoot eagles, we're going to go to a specific spot because we know that's going to be good for eagles. When we want to shoot deer, we're going to mm -hmm. go to a specific spot. So that helps us a lot mm -hmm. too, you know, I mean, it's not, right, yeah. I mean, we're not doing amazing stuff out in the middle of a forest where it's you never know what your well, chances are at. You get in, in areas where animals aren't exposed to people too like you get up on the tundra with caribou oh right and they're like hey what are you I've never <laughs> seen one of you guys before and they come right over <laughs> that's right. true but if you're filming white-tailed deer um, you know typically to be a smart wildlife photographer you don't go where they're subject to a lot of hunting pressure right? Right. you find places and pockets and populations that have some exposure to people so they're a little more relaxed around mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and that's that's part of that balance and being a smart wildlife photographer is researching where to go for most efficiency mm -hmm. results for that right. too so right. but there are places I, I love being out in, in true wilderness when you do encounter that animal Sometimes on my Instagram feed, I'll, I'll say that, but a caribou, because it looks like it's looking at me with this look of confusion or curiosity. It's like, could I be the first person that saw it? Maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah. something cool to yeah. that. That's a good point. I didn't, I didn't think about it that way, but that's very true. Mm -hmm. well, it's that balance, but yeah. Well, I know when I'm, um, when I'm hunting, and I see an animal and it prevents or presents a, sh a shot, um, maybe it's 40 yards and it presents a shot to its vitals where I can make a clean kill, I take that shot. Like you see here, how many times an animal is partially be obscured by brush or grass. So this terrain back here, I'm telling you, if you're not from, if you haven't spent time in the boreal or on tundra land and you look behind it, it looks like, I think the like Colorado foothills or whatever, it's mostly grassland, right? And dry, so if, that's what I picture, that's what I think of when I see this. You get in that, and that grass down there will actually obscure these moose up to their chest or even their shoulders in places. And we are, we're below it. Like we're trying to shoot through grass. So it's not a matter of just having a shot at an animal. When you're taking a picture of it, you need that full animal to be presented. And you need the light behind you, which is another thing you never consider when you're hunting. Right. Unless you're worried about being, you know, highlighted by the sun on you and you're in a blind or something, or if you're duck hunting. But that, it's, it's, that may be actually more similar to wildlife photography than other things, other uh, uh, game hunting, but that uh, that's what makes it much more difficult. It's not, you're looking for perfect opportunities, not just any opportunity. So I find that intriguing. I'm really, really fascinated by the, what wildlife photography is already teaching me and what you guys have been learning for 25 years. Yeah, and you never stop learning. It's amazing. I mean, there's something all the time. Yeah. Whether you pick, you see someone do something, and you're like, "Oh, that's really cool," or you just see some an animal do something that mm -hmm. you, you blows you away. Mm -hmm. Like I had no idea. Well, we think we all learned on this trip. I think Marky said, "I'm not sure about you. I didn't know they ate fireweed." Good well, job. they're wrecking the scene. <laughs> there are all these beautiful fireweed, and all this brilliant color, and as the bull went through the scene, he's nipping them all off. It's like no Stop. way. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know, and that that is that comes from you know a lot of times we're trying to film an animal in their prime, right? So with a lot of these antlered big game animals, prime is during the rut, right? And it's the fall, and there's not fireweed around. So True, I think yeah. you just don't get around them in that. We're here in the summer now. Yeah. Fireweed's plentiful, and then you're like, huh? They do eat fireweed, you know? They'll they, they, and probably pretty beneficial. Oh, sure. Yeah. Didn't you say it was edible? Did I remember? Yeah, I did. I've been eating it as we're walking along. I'm actually been nibbling on it. You have? Yeah. All right. I pro I'm ruining the habitat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You're ruining the scene. Bruce and Sean are, are responsible. <laughs> you know, I always I research, of course, we're back where the cabin is, where I live, the, the wild edibles around there. I did, wouldn't have known fireweed wasn't edible if I wasn't reading Dick Prennicke's books, because he would go out. That was his salad that would go with his meal. Oh. He was eating fireweed. The whole, the whole above ground plant then, or just the flower? Or? Leaves. Just not the flower, just not the, the flower. Yeah, I don't know. If he, he didn't mention the flower, okay. and I would t 
typically the flowers are also edible if the leaves are, but not always. It okay. could, could be different. So I haven't been eating the flowers. I've only been eating the leaves. Okay. And he was treating it as you would any gr green. You would make salads or steam it. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. So that's another thing about getting out, um, not being just a hunter. When you're out, when you're passionate about Passionate hunters, first of all, do follow wildlife year-round. If you're a deer hunter, you love hunting deer and you love deer, because hunters love animals, not just hunting them, uh, typically. Uh, then you spend time with them year-round. Well, wildlife photography is getting us out experiencing something that I wouldn't have bothered if I was just a hunter. I would only know their fall behavior. Right. That's yeah, the most I think that's, Or that's the chance that those people get to get out into the woods. You right, know, take yeah. your vacation sure. and it's like, okay, I'm going to go hunting. Mm -hmm. Whereas... Photography forces you to go out, yeah, you know, all the time. You're right, and yeah. you see all Gives you a reason. Of yeah, I don't like just going for a hike. I always want a purpose behind that hike. And <laughs> I'm the same. Yeah. Say, like, yeah, I don't want to say this on tape, but around be recorded. But you know, we do family camping trips to a beach, to a campsite, and stay in one spot for days. I'm like, I just, I, I want a purpose. I can't stay and just be here for days. Where are the animals? Where are the wildlife? What viewpoint can I get to to see something? Right. Or what lake can I? There's just, yeah, so that's, fuel is, uh, the motivation for these trips are, are, is the subject. Mm -hmm. My example of that is people, I have a lot of friends, they want to climb a 14er. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, if there's a pica up there, <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> but if all we're doing is hiking just to go to say we were at the top of this mountain and we're looking, I can get that from any top of any mountain, <laughs> but it's going to have wildlife on it. Right. right. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. That's right. something we all share then, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So backgrounds, just, uh, I don't know who, who wants to start, but to want to hear how you got into wildlife photography in particular, and or what you do for a career, and and uh, how this fits into that, into your your career as well as your life. All right, all right, Mark, all right. Take it away, the man. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I when I was. 15 and uh, I had a neighbor down the street who worked in the Department of Natural Resources and he hired me on as a summer student and that's kind of when opened the door. I, at that age had no idea what I wanted to do with my life or what was even possible and I started working in forestry with him and from 15 right through finishing my degree in wildlife biology in university I worked through different departments in natural resources throughout that time frame from wildlife or some forestry then to fisheries and then wildlife which is where my heart and soul wanted to be but when I was finishing my degree I was doing research on white-tailed deer with the ambition of being a, a biologist and a research scientist I met a professional wildlife photographer in the field where I was studying this deer population and it, the light bulb just turned on because in in working for the government or private organization it's where the research is required would be the direction of my life and I would have no necessarily say whether I'd be studying polar bears which would be cool or lemmings which would be mm, I don't know if I want a whole year of lemmings kind of thing whereas this wildlife photographer could decide as long as there was a viable market for the content he was creating could decide what he would spend his year doing and he wanted help finding the white-tailed deer and I knew that where they were because of my intensive research of this population I knew nothing really about cameras. I'd taken pictures for years, but never had a telephoto lens, so the photos were never great. But when I met him, we kind of collaborated. I helped him find the animals and then learned quickly about the camera equipment and then more importantly, the business side of being a professional wildlife photographer. So by the time I finished my degree, I was pursuing that wholeheartedly and it was a great time of life to do it. I didn't have family commitments or any children at that point so I could invest all my extra money and time in traveling and building a portfolio. And back then, it was 25 years ago, um, you had to build a portfolio of many thousands of images because when you knocked on a publication's door, first of all, they had to be as good or better than anything they were using for them to want to take on a new photographer. But if they did take a photographer on, you have to back it up for the next article. It's not just a one and done or they lose interest quickly. So it was a matter back in that time frame of shooting lots of slides and, and creating a portfolio for submissions. The landscape's changed a bit now that it's digital. And that could be a whole other podcast or blog conversation we won't get into. But that's where I went and I just followed various species that I've just always been really 
enthralled with and built a niche portfolio of specialization on large North American mammals and antlered animals in specific but also bears and became known for that and have pursued that ever since and I've never got tired of it. Wow. Every experience even today with these moose, I mean I've not in any way saying it but I've had you know 300 days like this but it's, it was just as ex exciting to be here today mm. with these that's animals cool. and watch them. Yeah that's hard in any career to anything in life not even just jobs but to stay passionate about something mm. for that long or that inter interesting so you've um you were like for my audience how did, how do you how did you make a living at it like what um well it, like when were you published or who were you selling to so and by by the time i was in my early 20s i had my first published picture was a magazine cover and that was the market that really caught my eye because magazines need content regularly mm -hmm. whether it's a monthly publication or even a quarterly one they're always looking for the next best story so knowing they constantly needed new material it was a motivation and, and I always I just loved what magazines were what they shared with with people as far as no matter what the subject was it's mm -hmm. the best of that area whether it's a photography magazine a hunting and fishing magazine and to create that content and so in the peak of the magazine industry, it's changed a lot now in 2019. But you know, 10 or 15 years ago, there were so many publications. So I worked with 50 or 60 different magazines wow. on a regular basis, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in North America at that time. And so there's ongoing, uh, that was a big part of the business. I do a lot of calendar content. It's the same idea. Calendars have to be done annually. So I've done moose calendar after moose calendar after moose calendar, and they new images every year, new mm -hmm. settings, new environments, you know, whether it's from the east coast of Canada or here in Alaska or wherever moose may be to tell a different story and to make the content diverse. Mm -hmm. So that kept me going because I go to different destinations or different seasonality mm -hmm. as well. And then I've done books on, on these subjects as well. And now with the digital world, it's just changed so that it's a global platform. There aren't as many magazines because of the online platforms right. out there and media outlets, but the, you know there are still enough publications to be a viable industry. But globally now, you know, I have clients all around the world because they're sharing information for travel, you know, various destinations. If people mm -hmm. want to, there are a lot of people in in Germany or the UK that just want to come and experience Alaska. It is, and so by having the great content to share with those audiences in these markets, it's, it's grown that way. So when some markets have sh shrunken with digital, others have expanded. Hmm. And but so that's, it's, that's it's remained viable. Yeah, because a lot of people I would assume now, including myself, that there's no market for a wildlife photographer anymore because there's so many people taking photos and they're so accessible. But there are a variety of platforms, but it's a challenge. Marketing, as in any business structure, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. paramount for success. I've known mm -hmm. many talented photographers who were not successful financially because they didn't market well. Mm -hmm. So that's still a part of the business, mm -hmm. and it's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you said, any business, really. right? You can have a great product, but the world doesn't know about it. And social media is a whole new platform. You know, there are images where I'll. I'll put something up on my Instagram feed and then somebody will order a, a canvas from it. Hmm. And that wasn't possible before because how would they have seen my slides? Right, yeah. Unless it was in a magazine and they wrote me a letter or gave me a phone call. <laughs> with digital, they look at it and say, and they go to the website and, and the same with Michael, they can just order it right there. And, you know, it's it's a changed industry as well because I can, you know, I might have four printing houses that might do metals or prints or canvases and I can have it printed, produced and shipped directly to the client. Yeah. So that platform is so much user friendly in the modern yeah. age. So right. it's it's changing, and it's important to stay abreast of it, to stay in the business, and that's part of our podcasting too, right? Yeah. It's all branched out into storytelling oh, yeah, and, yeah. and sharing that content. Right. And that's becoming an important part of our business, and you know, a significant time commitment, and, and mm -hmm. something we love to do, and we're very optimistic about mm -hmm. as yeah, well. Good. Yeah, it's a digital magazine. Yeah, our podcast and and multi, you know, multiple presentations. It's great to you know create a story for YouTube like your amazing vlogs and and have a photo to put in while we're talking about it or a video yeah. clip. Yeah, you know, right, right, yeah, for sure. So that's that's 
That's, that's, your, that's me in a nutshell. It's your story and you're sticking to it. It's your full time. <laughs> yeah, for 25 years, this is what I've done. Love every minute of it. I, you that's know, the dream, man. That's, I've raised, you know, our yeah, family with yeah. a wonderful daughter and son and, and lived in an amazing place and seen countless destinations. I, yeah, not a moment I regret. And I'm so grateful and feel very blessed and privileged to, to have had this life. And very fortunate for that. But I also recognize for people just like yourself who succeed in their own business venture, you know, there's a tremendous amount of work and commitment, dedication, yeah. and passion. All those elements have to be there. So with any young person, you know, you hope they find that spark yeah, yeah, and absolutely. have that motivation. And yeah. I, I was addicted to this. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started into wildlife photography, like this, I, I want to do that. And there was no looking behind me, mm -hmm. and there still isn't. You know, I'm. Uh, you know, passion is something. It's so cliche these days. It's say you know, have passion for whatever you do, or if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, and all that kind of stuff. It's another thing truly to live it because you can think you're passionate about something, or like something, or even love something, but unless your passion actually makes you almost a workaholic towards that thing, you won't have success. You won't have the success to the level that you could, at least. That, because it's work, hard work. There's no such thing as just you're passionate and you do a pretty good job at it because you're passionate. Right. It's you're passionate and you work your butt off at that thing. That's why you, you're successful. There is no shortcuts in life. Nobody makes it without working hard. No. I am a workaholic. The photography yeah. part of it, it is, never stops. Yeah. Is, a, I don't know, what would you say, 30%? Well, the actual clicking of the shutter? Or right? If, you know, I'd probably say, yeah, it was 25% is often, I, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's so much office time and editing. Mm -hmm. But it's, I've often wondered about that. You know, I've, I would say I'm a workaholic, mm -hmm. but I love what I do. Yeah. The only compromise, I, I, this is, I'd be willing to make this change, is to take what you're suggesting, all that 75% office time, and, and delegate that to somebody else and sh just shoot and travel more. And I think that's part of the, our incentive with the podcast, too, is the storytelling. And our hope is this podcast becomes so successful that we can have a production team around us which will only expand our potential for storytelling. Right, yeah. Right? right. Yeah. So that's that's our hope. But Yeah, it's as a father and a, and a husband, you know, it's something I sometimes have to stop and say, am I doing a good enough job in these areas mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I am so committed <laughs> to this lifestyle this work you know and when I, I have those same thoughts and and i realize that my family already knows this and they tell me this is that you would i would be not as good a person therefore not as good a person to them if i wasn't following my dreams and living my best life you wouldn't be any fun to be around you're right yeah that's who you are yeah. yeah help your your own health and your happiness actually has to come before health and happiness of your loved ones because you have to be the best you in order to help them achieve that for themselves so yep. yeah it, and it's yeah it, there's guilt associated with that but you have to be your per, your own person you can't live you can't rely on somebody else to create your happiness either you have to be the person that has that passion for yourself right that's, that's a good perspective mm -hmm. i've had people in my life you know i, I i've uh, if I should say this stuff again, <laughs> <laughs> I've been given the ultimatum, deer or me. I'm like, but, but the deer thing is who I am. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you're telling me to change who I am right. and not be who I am and create a different life for myself, which probably won't make me happy. Right. So what you said, yeah, you know, summarize. Yeah, and you won't want to be well. around me if I'm not happy. Right. So you know, find somebody, and you know, Pilly is is great. I mean, she's always supported my travel and trips mm -hmm. and and uh, joins me as frequently as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so what's My your... initial story is a lot like Mark's. I, I uh, grew up in a little small town in Colorado, mm -hmm. in the mountains, southwest Colorado, and we spent every every minute when we weren't in school, we were in the mountains. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to get a job, I'm going to be in the mountains. So I went to school. And I didn't have a lot of coaching or counseling. It was just whatever I thought might get me there, right? So I got a a degree as a biologist mm -hmm. and through that process I got a job with the National Park Service. Were, were your folk, were your, to explain a little bit because I don't, I wanted to do biology too but I just didn't have the discipline to go through, to do well enough in school to go down that path. I didn't so. either, so I don't know no. how I made it but 
<laughs> I was like, I want to be outside, yeah. so I've got to do this. So let's was, figure was there, it out. And was there a focus? Your know, like biology is, gen is pretty broad. Yeah, no, I did environmental biology, okay. but that was the only program they offered at the time at sure. that school that I went to. So okay. it was heavy into wildlife, mm -hmm. but we didn't have like a zo zoological degree that okay. we could get. It was just an environmental biology degree. Right. But like I said, there was no coaching. My folks were both teachers, okay. so they were just like, okay, figure it yeah. out. You're yeah. going to go do something, yeah. figure it out, and do what you want to do. So it got me into the, the park service, and I'll never forget, my first job when I got a permanent job with the park service was, I was low man on a totem pole, right? This wildlife photographer shows up, and I'm working at Mesa Verde National Park, so it's an archaeological park, mainly. But it's a hidden gem for wildlife because yeah. most people come there to check out yeah, the, right. the the ruins. But they've got the protection. But yeah, you, it's park. like a national park, and there were these monster mule deer. Yeah. This wildlife photographer knew about them, and so he coordinated a permit with the national park. And the deal was, is he could go anywhere in that park. The thing is, is that park is restricted. So since it's all Archeolog this archaeological yeah, stuff, yeah. they don't just let you go wherever you want to yeah, go. Okay. But he wanted to go to these areas that were kind of closed off. And they said, okay, you can go to those areas as long as a park service person is with you. So that was me. I got that's the job awesome. to just hang out with this guy all summer. <laughs> and that's where it really was like, holy moly, this yeah. dude makes a living yeah. hanging out with wildlife. So right then it just was switched on and I'm like, how do I do this? And I've always been interested in photography. In college, I took a ton of photography classes, got really proficient with it you know the professors used to have me process their images for mm -hmm. them in the dark room so I was I was digging it but I just it, it back then it didn't even click it wasn't like I was, that was like more of a fun thing that yeah, was yeah. like the artsy thing that right. you would do when you had time off but when I saw this guy actually making a living at it and I'm starting to put it all together I'm thinking okay then this is what I'm gonna do but no money so what do you do with the camera right mm -hmm. uh, I went and bought the best camera I could get for the money, I, well, actually, my dad helped me. It was like 300 bucks, some sort of di or yeah. film camera, yeah. and a little cheap 300 millimeter lens, and I was off <laughs> to to make it all happen. And there, so you must have shot there to begin. Yeah, with. cause he he opened my eyes, and I didn't know anything. You know, there's so much to produce in a really awesome picture, and. <laughs> The, along those lines is I would go out and shoot all this stuff and I'd look at these images and I'd be like, oh man, that's so awesome. I got yeah. the best picture on the planet here. <laughs> and I'd show him and he'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> this is so bad. You never shoot a picture of the butt of the animal. You never shoot a picture of an animal laying down. You never, you know, there's no eye shine. There's all these elements and it was crushing, but it that's what made me yeah. figure it out. Yeah. You know, I, it, I just, kept pers persevering and kept going and kept going and uh, from that point I just you know it was non-stop and any chance I got extra money I would improve my equipment because you had to have a certain level of equipment yeah. and then it's just time in the woods and you, and like Mark you start marketing stuff to magazines and so you start getting the stuff published and you work with a lot of the editors and they know oh this guy's got good mule deer stuff and so you get called up and was that your specialty it was always big game for yeah. sure you yeah. know antlered animals it's just intriguing yeah. but i quickly you know wanted to branch out as fast as i could so i came to alaska pretty quickly no oh. yeah so I, you know you early 90s you guys yeah i started coming to alaska in 92 as the first trip up here 92 wow, wow. Yeah, so it, and and you just see all this stuff up here, and you're like, oh wow, yeah, okay, it's well, good as where I am from is decent. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I still love that down there, but there's nothing that compares to up here for me. I mean, it's just pretty amazing up here. So the photography world was at that time super competitive. Oh, okay, and it's always been really competitive. I mean, I'm competing against guys like Mark, mm -hmm. and there's probably I don't know how many. <laughs> How many <laughs> top wildlife photographers are there that do what we do? There's probably a hundred. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I I quickly figured out, I don't know that I'm going to rise to the top through all this stuff. Video is just starting out. So I started transferring into video thinking, hmm, maybe I can make a go 
a full-time living if I incorporate video into my you still do the stills but then try to shoot the video when how long ago was that then when, when would you have started so I would have started that in probably like 90 in the wow. late 90s okay that's early it was early it was yeah. like SD cameras really bad you know just the old square format and so um, hopefully I'm gonna insert right here if Michael will share some of that with me this footage he got what 2002 was that that was 2000 I think or maybe it was 2002 I don't know 2000 maybe I don't know I think it was 2000 2000 I'll, I'll put a t tiny clip on here with his permission but go check his out and he'll let me know where he's posting that and and if, I'll put it in the description below yeah so it's gonna be a little small square on your screen compared to what so we can awesome. shoot like nowadays I'm, I mean that's like it was unbelievable yeah yeah once in a lifetime opportunity so yeah. that's cool so the fact that you're again you create opportunities you create opportunities for yourself by being opportunities pre get presented to you because you put yourself into the right position. right position the fact that you're already filming at that stage of your career and you went to a place where you could experience something like that yeah it was that's awesome at that time with video the easiest jobs to get to be wildlife oriented were hunting shows no really I shot a lot of hunting really? shows. Yeah. Okay. And I got in with a company where I traveled the world. I was in Africa. We were all over Europe. We were all over Alaska. We were all over the place. I didn't know that. Doing a bunch of hunting shows and and but it was it was awesome because you traveled and you got to go see some cool stuff. But it was talk about long days. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just nonstop. Mm -hmm. So I did that for not as long as I maybe a year and a half. And then I, I was like, you know what? It, it's, it's kind of a evolving thing too, and I really didn't like the place. So I was like, you know, I'm done with that. And then I just started my own company. So we started producing videos, um, not in the hunting world because I was kind of done with that. I stayed with the wildlife, but then I was going for any video job we could get. And so we started producing stuff for companies like Dick's Sporting Goods and uh, John Deere and those kinds of companies mm -hmm. and. When what? did you start your company? What? When did you start your company? <laughs> After I so, had to do my sneeze. That's hard to say. I mean, you know, it's everything's free flowing. Yeah, with, no, yeah. You know, no. you're working with someone, you're yeah. doing this, you're trying to start your own so thing. I guess you, the, maybe so the question it is, it would have been in the early 2000s. Okay, so you've been full time. So this is you've basically been filming and photography your entire career too. Then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. A lot of similarities that way. Yeah. yeah. And then it's it's culminated now where we're shooting. Last year I was shooting for Animal Planet, shot for Discovery. I've shot for all the networks, yeah. for the wildlife stuff. Yeah, that's cool. You know, if you can build a, a good little portfolio like Mark does with stills and you do that a video, and then, you know, people will find out. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, these guys are living the dream. I mean, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but it took me a while to get around to this, right? You guys have spent a career doing what everybody dreams of doing, and you've shown that the hard work and focus and stick to it in this is is worthwhile. I got distracted by family, which is not a distraction. I mean, it was a worthwhile distraction. It was a distraction, and uh, but otherwise, career following, chasing the the dream or to to climb that corporate ladder, which was the wrong dream for me, and it took me a while to fully realize that. So I dabbled. And continued to you know hunt and fish and do lots of outdoor stuff over those years but I got too far removed and it came to a screeching halt and it was the reason I had uh, some uh, business failures because I wasn't passionate about it. I was just not as focused as I would have been and I started drifting back to where my passions lay and consume me again and I had to take it up full-time these guys were able to continue doing that so that's awesome I, that's that's a maybe a, a rare thing for somebody to find passion early and stick with it and and, and live a life full life of, of that that's that's awesome that's why again that's why i'm with these guys i tell people all the time you just got to find that uh, younger people all the time you know and i hate no, i remember when people used to tell yeah, me stuff yeah. too and i'd be like eh. yeah but yeah. it's so true i mean yeah. you just got to find that one thing that just lights your fire and do it and for a lot of people, especially young people and young guys, uh, I can relate to more than young girls, is you, maybe you have to try a bunch of things. Like yeah. it came naturally. I think for a lot of people that are into the outdoors, it is so innate, it's so biologically in us that we are dr drawn to it 
from birth or from a young age and and it consumes us if it's not wildlife or photography or or outdoors though you might have to search for that thing that's your passion maybe, maybe it's motorbikes or planes or whatever it's something completely unrelated to what i i'm passionate about that you won't know that until you try a bunch of things so those i know when i was an employer it was hard to hire young guys like in early 20s because i knew they were going to last six months and they were going to jump to another career i didn't look down on them because i remember what it was like to be in that position i tried a bunch of careers too you have to try them out you have to try a variety of things experience different things in order to find the thing that you're that you actually like enough to be passionate about the cool thing about being a photographer is you can have that you can be if so let's say it's motorcycles you can be a motorcycle photographer so you right, can yeah. actually make a living being a photographer but you can <laughs> photograph your passion right which essentially is what we do with wildlife but the, right. there's so many genres you could do if you wanted to yeah get into the photo thing. right or yeah, the video that's thing. true yeah yeah folks forget that yeah you can't be a generalist and that applies to a lot of things in life too you need to focus in a little bit tighter than yeah. just a general passion a general hobby or general career mm-hmm. mm. what's well, interesting so your so moral media is your company yep um now yeah well you yeah it's still the name of the company but somebody stole my web name that Flash. Well, they didn't steal it. This ding dong forgot to renew it, and somebody bought it. Oh, you're kidding! Me. Yeah, so uh, we go by Truth and Legend now. Truth and Legend Productions. Oh, okay. Um, which I actually like a lot. So yeah. to having it go, I mean, my yeah. business is still registered as Marvel Media, but Truth and Legend Productions is the okay. where we produce, and we still do stuff. We do tons of stuff for Dick Sporting Goods. We do a lot of uh, corporate type stuff, but okay. we'll shoot commercials for them. Yeah. For, you know that's cool so they can find you where at truthandlegends.com or truthandlegend.com truthandlegend. is uh it's just our like our portfolio yeah and it's not that most of our work is word of mouth so yeah. i don't even use a web page that much but yeah. there is stuff there for, okay. for sure and of course through wild exposed podcast they can and that's you. the passion right i mean to be able to take what we do and share it and if and we get inspired all the time by the comments we get i mean mm-hmm. people are really I hope it goes somewhere because mm-hmm. we are getting a lot of cool feedback where people are like, yeah, keep it coming, keep it coming. We really like learning. And so eventually I think we'd both like to just say that's that's the, the only thing that we do. The thing, the reason it's worth checking these guys out, and I know I give endorsements when I can. I, I get so many comments. Like there's, I have about 1.1 million followers or something on my social media accounts. And I appreciate every one of them, you guys, and I listen. I actually read still to this day every single comment, good and bad. You know, then I got the emotional roller coaster of reading good and bad every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I would love to endorse everybody who's trying to do something like this and is asking my, for my opinion on how they you know, start a success, successful YouTube channel and everything. But um, there is there's the work ethic. There's working hard at something. There is the experience. These guys have 25 years experience doing this. There is the commitment to it. There's the high level of quality because of pride and and uh, and that experience and age. The Dick Prenicky, like he said, and like I remind people, he was 40 or 50. He retired at 50 to do that cabin. He didn't just start off being a cabin builder and a filmmaker documenting that. You need to get some experience. You need to be so passionate that you're working 20 hours a day during periods and maybe even at the uh, slower period in your life you're working 16 hours a day on that thing you have to be passionate these guys have the passion I do endorse what they're doing because I feel like they're quality guys doing quality work and they've earned the position that they're in now and they've earned uh, more recognition for what they're doing on a more global scale on the new social media platforms so don't forget a lot of guys um, of my generation and older have had success just not in this new uh, social media digital age Mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of discovery and and unfortunately a lot of people that do more dramatic or crazy things are the people that or makeup tutorials and things like that that's the you know (laughs) they get more traction than people that are hiking into the Alaskan mountains or or in my case building a cabin and you feel like wow look at the effort I'm putting into this but I'm, I'm more traditional than new age digital 
so it, it, it's hard to getting discovered for guys like us that are used to that that uh, bricks and mortar age so yeah that, that's for that reason like i said i'm hanging out with these guys I had a, such a good time i know we're going to do more stuff together and please go and check them out at the wild and exposed podcast youtube channel now and on their podcast and then you can follow, find them individually. And Ron, we haven't been talking about Ron much here, but he's part of it as well. Great guy, him and his son. Had a good time with them, and I hope to spend more time with them as well. So check all these guys out through through the Wild and Exposed podcast uh, media, though, ch channels. Anything else you guys want to say? No, we appreciate that for sure. Yeah. And it's been fun. I mean, like I said earlier, I was, meeting you was pretty cool. It was cool to actually cool. put a, an actual... <laughs> relationship rather than talking yeah. over Skype or just seeing your stuff online it's it's yeah. actually cool I appreciate you following along it's cool it's been fun I look forward to the next one yeah 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 me too all right that's it we are going to shut this video down we're gonna decide whether we're more hungry or more motivated to go out and capture wildlife I think hunger is probably gonna rule and uh, get some rest so that we can head back out again and then couple of days from now I'm back to Ontario Canada where the cabin is and getting back to work so thanks I keep, for I keep waiting for a links to walk through before you close it oh, out be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> keep, keep an eye on you that's the kind of place where hopefully something happened while we were all talking <laughs> yeah, right. let us know I'll point it out so <laughs> the Wolverine bound it through. that's awesome so yeah thanks guys thanks everybody for watching and uh, yeah, look forward to the next videos. I'm excited to share what I'm going to be doing with you for the rest, or I'm going to be doing at the cabin for the rest of the year. So please uh, keep checking in on both channels and check these guys out as well. Take care and have a great week, and I will see you up at the cabin next time.